Hello, this is Distrigneer, and once again I'm reading from the Thousand Nights and One Night. However, you must know that um, this giant tome of tales um, holds many adult themes like alcohol and rape and incest and necrophilia and a whole bunch of other stuff. So um, what you hear tonight uh, probably don't exercise in person. And uh, these tales are for amusement and some of them are allegory and so on and so forth and I'm rambling. So this is the end of my disclaimer and I hope you enjoy listening as much as I enjoy reading uh, this to you. And when the seventh night had come, she said, it is related, O auspicious king, that when the fishes spoke in this manner, the young girl upset the pan with a wand and departed by the fish in the wall, which closed after her. This is a thing we can in no wise keep from the king, exclaimed the vizier. So he sought out the king and told him the whole circumstances. This is a thing that I must see for myself, cried the king, and sending for the fisherman, he commanded him to fetch four other fish of the like kind, allowing him three days in which to complete the manor. But the fisherman had hurried to the lake and came back immediately with four more fish, for which he was given four hundred dinars at the king's command. Then the king ordered his vizier to prepare the fish himself in the royal presence. I hear and I obey, answered the vizier, and conducting the king to the kitchen, he carefully cleaned the fish and, in the king's sight, set them in the pan to fry. When they cooked on one side, he turned them. Immediately the kitchen wall opened and through it entered a negro, as ugly as a great buffalo one of the giants of the tribe of Had. He carried a green branch in his hand and said in a distinct and terrible voice, Fish, fish, are you faithful? Then all the fish lifted their heads from inside the pan and cried, Yes, yes, we are. And in a chorus they intoned these lines, Come back and so will we. Keep faith and we'll keep faith. But if you show us treachery, it shall be to your scathe. Then the negro came up to the pan and upset it with his branch, so that the fish fell out and were burnt to black cinders. Finally he departed by the way he had come, and the king said, Here is a matter on which it is impossible to keep silent. Certainly there is some strange tale connected with these fishes. So he sent for the fishermen and asked him where the fishes came from. From a lake between four hills, he answered, beyond the mountain which looks down upon your city. How many days' journey is it? Asked, it? asked the king. My lord is not more than a half an hour away, the other answered. So the sultan set out forthwith, taking his soldiers with him, and also the fishermen, who went along in a confused state of mind, secretly cursing their feet. At length the king's party passed over the mountain and came down into a desert valley, such as they had never seen before. They marveled at it, and at the lake, and at the fish of different colors, red, white, yellow, and blue, which swam within... Halting his men, the king asked if anyone there had seen a lake in that place, and, when all had answered they had not, he said, As Allah lives, I will never more go back to my city or sit upon my throne until I have found out the truth about this lake and these strange fishes. Then, sending out his men to inspect the mountains round about, he called his vizier to him, who was a scholar and a sage, an eloquent man of great learning. To him the king said, There is a thing I mean to do, and I must tell you of it. I have determined to go forth alone tonight and seek out unaided the answer to the mystery of this lake. Your part will be to stand guard at the door of my tent and tell any viziers, emirs, or chamberlains who may seek my audience that I am ill and have given order that none may be admitted. Above all, tell no one of my plan. The vizier promised to obey, and the king, having disguised himself and girt on his sword, slipped out unperceived from among his bodyguard. All that night and through the next morning he journeyed on, stopping only to sleep through the noonday heat. Then he continued his quest throughout the rest of the day and the following night. On the second morning he saw a black object far off and joyfully exclaimed, Surely yonder I fi shall find someone to tell me the story of the lake. Coming nearer, he saw that the thing was a palace built all of black stones fastened together with great clamps of steel. Stopping at the mighty double door, one half of which was open, he knocked softly, once, twice, and again, without receiving any answer. The fourth time, he knocked with great violence, and still no one came. So supposing the palace to be deserted, he plucked up his courage and entered. O masters of this place, I am a stranger, a wayfarer, and I come to ask a little refreshment in my journey. He repeated this twice more, and, getting no reply, became emboldened to go along the corridor as far as the very center of the palace. Here he found no one, though all the place was splendid with star-wrought tapestries, and, in the middle of the inner court, four lions of red gold held up a fountain, spraying so fair a water that it had the appearance of diamonds and white pearls. About the court were many birds, which could not fly away because of great golden nets stretched above the pl palace. The king marveled at all these things, and yet he grieved in his heart to find no one there who could explain the riddle of the lake, the mountain, the fish, and the palace. Soon he sat down between two of the doors in a profound reverie, which was suddenly cut short by a feeble voice of complaint, rising, it seemed, from a surcharged heart. He heard these lines sung in a sweet whisper. 
I could not keep my love down. He rose and pinned my sleepy eyes awake. He crept into my voice and made it break my heart and made it ache. I could not keep love down. He rose and lighted fires within my brain, and all the water of the world are vain to put them out again. Moving towards the sound of this low planing, the king found a door covered by a curtain. Lifting the curtain, he saw a young man lying upon his elbow on a great bed in a mighty hall. He was fair and supple, dowered with the very voice of music. His brow was like a flower, and his cheeks like the vo flowers of roses. Also, on one of those cheeks there lay a mole like the fragment of black amber. The poet has said, Sweet and slim is the boy, with hair of shadows paling in the night, and a brow of light making the stars seem gray. My eyes have turned his way, and found a joy of which I dare not speak, in a nut-brown beauty spot which he has got below his dark eye on his rose-leaf cheek. The king rejoiced at the sight of this young man, and said to him, Peace be with you. But the youth, who wore a robe of gold embroidered silk, did not move from his position on the bed, and it was with great sorrow, both of voice and feature, that he greeted the king, saying, Excuse me, my lord, for not rising. Thereupon the king said, Tell me, O fair young man, the story of the lake and the colored fishes, and also the reason of this palace and your solitude and your tears. At these words the youth wept even more sourly, and answered, What is there in the evil fate that has come upon me that I should not weep? So saying, he moved his thin hand towards the skirts of his garments and lifted them away from his body. Then the king saw that the lower half of the youth was all marble, while the upper half of his body, from his navel to the hair upon his head, remained that of a man. As he stood there staunch, the young man said to him, You must know, my lord, that the tale of the fishes is indeed a strange tale. Were it written with a bodkin on the inner corner of an eye, yet would it be a lesson for a man of mind. And the youth told this story. The Tale of the Young Man and the Fishes Know, my lord, that my father was the king of a city which you see not, and yet it was here. His name was Mahmud, and he was master of the Black Isles, which are now four mountains. He reigned for seventy years before passing to the mercy of Allah, renumerator of the world. After his death I became sultan and took to my wife my cousin, the daughter of my uncle, who so well loved me that if I left her even for a short while she neither ate nor drank till my return. For five years I cherished her until a day came when she went to the hammam, after having ordered an alluring supper for us from the cook. Then I entered this hall of my palace and lay down to sleep in my accustomed place, bidding two of my girl slaves to move their fans above me as I slept. One sat at my head and the other on my feet, but I could not sleep for thinking of my wife, and, though my eyelids closed, my wits remained alert. Thus it was that I heard the slave at my head say to the other on my feet, How ill-starred is the youth of our poor lord, Masuda! How sad is it he should have married our mistress, that bitch, that unclean whore! God's curse on all adulteresses, the other replied. This bastard who spends her nights in every vagabond bed is a millionfold too evil to be the wife of our master. And yet, said the first slave, you must be very innocent not to notice the woman's goings-on. How can you say that, objected the other? What choice does she give him to suspect her? Why, every night she puts something into the wine he drinks before he sleeps. She mixes bond with the drink, and he sleeps like the dead. How then can he know what she does and where she goes? After making him drink the drugged wine, she dresses and goes out and stays away till morning. When she comes back, she burns a scented something below his nose, and he wakes fresh from his sleep. My lord, when I heard the conversation of these slaves, light became darkness before my eyes, and yet in my impatience I thought that night would never fall. At last, however, my wife came back from the hammam, and, spreading the cloth, we ate for an hour, giving each other drinks as was our custom. When I asked for the final cup, which I drank every night before my sleep, and she handed it to me, I put it to my lips, but instead of drinking, spilled it secretly into the upper fold of my robe. At once I lay down on my bed and feigned to go to sleep. Then I heard her saying, Sleep, you devil, sleep and never wake. As Allah lives, I hate you, yes, every inch of you, and my soul sickens when you are near. After this she rose, dressed herself in her finest garments, perfumed herself, girt on my sword, and left the palace. Instantly I rose and followed her. She crossed all the markers of the city, and, coming at last to the outer gate, spoke to them in a tongue I did not understand, and, lo, the locks fell from their places. The gate swung open of themselves, and she went out beyond the city. I followed her unnoticed till she came to certain mounds formed by the heaping up of refuse, in the middle of which was a round house built of dry mud and topped by a dome of the same. This place she entered by a door, and I, climbing up into the balcony of the dome, lay still to watch. I saw her enter below into the room of a hideous coal-black negro, whose upper lip was like the lid of a stew-pot, and his lower lip like the stew-pot itself. Great pendulous lips they were, they could have sorted pebbles from the sands of the floor. He was rotten with the diseases, and lay on a heap of refuse of sugar-cane. 
Seeing him, my wife, the daughter of my uncle, kissed the earth between his hands, and he, lifting up his head, addressed her thus. Curse you, why are you so late? I have had other black men here, drinking wine and having their girls, but I had not the heart to drink because you were not here. Master, darling of my heart, do you not know that I am now married to my cousin, the son of my uncle, that I hate the least detail of his face and filled with horror to be near him? <sighs> if it were not for fear that you would come to harm, I should have long ago have destroyed his city from pinnacle to base, leaving but the voices of owls and of crows to be heard in our streets, hung the stones of a ruin beyond the mountain of Kath. You lie, you bitch, the negro answered, and I swear to you on the honor and the great virility of black men, on a mighty superiority over all whites, that if you are late once again after today, I will throw you aside and never lay my body above yours again. Unfaithful, whore, file, foulest of white girls, you are only late because you have been sating your lust with someone else. My lord, continued the prince, you can believe that when I saw I heard with my own ears this fearful conversation and saw with my own eyes what followed between the two. The world grew very black before my face, and I knew not where I was. Then my wife, my cousin, wept in terrible humility before the negro, saying, Lover, fruit of my heart, there is none but you. Dear boy, dear light of life, send me not away. When at last he pardoned her because of her weeping, she was filled with joy and, rising, took off all her clothes, even to her petticoat trousers, and stood before him quite naked. Then she said, Master, have you no refreshment of your slave? Look in the pot, answered the other. You will find a stew of rat's bones, and there is some beer in the jerry which you may drink. When she had eaten and drunken, she washed her hands and came and lay with the negro on the bed of trash. She was naked and cuddled against him under the unclean rags. When I saw this, I could contain myself no longer. Jumping from the dome, I rushed into the room and snatched the sword which my wife was carrying, determined to kill them both. First I slashed the negro across his neck and thought I had killed him. At this point, Shahrazad saw the approaching of morning and discreetly fell silent. When the day had come, King Shahyar entered his hall of justice and the Dewan sat until nightfall. Then the king returned to his palace and Dunyazad said to her sister, I pray you go on with your story. With all my heart is in duty bound, she answered.